Hi everyone, I'm Joanna Penn from the creativepen.com and today I'm here with Catherine Goldman. Hi Catherine. Hi Joanna, how are you? I'm great, it's so good to have you on the show. Just a little introduction. So Catherine is an intellectual property attorney who protects writers, artists, filmmakers and businesses from having their work and art ripped off, which is brilliant. And today we're talking about estate planning, which I am super interested in. But Catherine, just start by uh, telling us a bit about your background and why you care particularly about authors and artists. Let me let me start very quickly by saying, first of all, I'm not an estates and a trust and trusts attorney. That I'm a copyright attorney, um, but over the years, I've represented a number of artists and writers who have had um, copyright issues. Some of, I mean, estates issues. Mm. Some of them are second generation artists and have inherited copyrights from their parents. And so we've had to deal with that. Um, so I've become sensitive to these issues over time, and that's how I've learned about them. Um, so what I, as we talk today, really my goal is just to make everybody more thoughtful about how they handle their rights. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wanted to kind of clarify that I'm a copyright attorney and not an estates and trusts lawyer. Um, but aside from that, um, my interest in artists and writers, um, I grew up surrounded by artists and writers. Um, my mom was a dean of the Maryland Institute College of Art, and so she was always bringing home stray artists <laughs> for dinner. Um, and my dad was a newspaper editor, so I was always surrounded by the writerly type. Um, and my undergraduate degree is in art history. Yeah, so I, it's an odd thing, art history to law. Um, but so I have a fondness for writers and artists. And as a lawyer, I have a skill set that I believe uh, can really help artists and writers. So um, my goal is to help them uh, learn what their rights are, enforce their rights so that they can protect their art and uh, make a living from it. Which, which is all fantastic. And I mean, I wonder if you have any opinion on why do our authors and artists in particular have such an aversion to law and the legal stuff? Well, it's not just artists and writers who have an aversion to the law. Everybody considers talking to their lawyer like eating spinach, you know? It's, it's just not anybody's favorite thing. Um, but you know, once you get used to it and once you understand what your rights are, um, it, it's less daunting and you, you become more comfortable with, with dealing with the law in your business and in your work um, if you understand it. And so maybe it's because people don't understand it so much and I really try to make it understandable and make the law um, accessible to creative types. Mm. And at the end of the day, it's mainly a language that we don't understand, isn't it? That's basically uh, yes. it. <laughs> well, you know, I think lawyers, it's, it's, they write many times so that people don't understand, mm. um, which is unfortunate. But, uh, you know, you shouldn't have to have a translator to understand the law. So I try to break it down and make it understandable for people. Yeah, exactly. And there are some really key things. Now, um, as I mentioned to you, we've had Helen Sedwick on the show before talking mm -hmm. about copyright and some of those things. But today I wanted to talk about estate planning because I saw an article that you wrote and it's something I'm really hot and into, um, particularly because I like graveyards and things. Um, but uh, <laughs> And I think about mortality a lot. But um, it just start by explaining what is estate planning anyway and why is it important for authors to consider it? Okay, um, well estate planning is basically succession planning for your worldly goods. Um, it's making decisions about what happens to your stuff after you die. And the fact is that copyright in your written work or in your artwork um, lasts a lot longer than you do. And so you have this period that you get to control what happens to those 
copyrights um, from the grave, essentially, in your will or in a trust document. And so estate planning with respect to intellectual property, which is all we're going to be talking about today, is what you want to think about when you, um, how you want your works handled after you die. And so that's what we're talking about uh, with respect to your creative portfolio and estate planning, the controls that you're going to put on the work after you die. Copyright lasts in England and in the US and in many other countries um, 70 years after your death. So that's a pretty long time mm -hmm. that, you, that you need to be thinking about where your portfolio could be generating income for your heirs or your charities of choice. And so that's what estate planning is all about, making those plans. Mm. And I personally find it really exciting, um, you know, because th this is a very new thing for indies as well. I think, you know, people in the old school, you know, agents dealt with this type of thing, but we're in this new world now where indies are dealing with their own stuff. So the fact that we might still be able to earn money for our heirs and successors, you know, 70 years after we die, I think is like a magic, exciting thing. But does it, does everyone react like me? <laughs> um, well, um, writers of a certain age react like you do. Uh, younger writers that I work with um, do not have, it's, I mean, they're immortal. I work with poets and writers who are in their 20s and people in their 20s are still immortal. So it just doesn't cross their mind, but I impress upon them that this is something that they need to think about. Um, so, um, but to go to your point about it being new for indies, it is very new. The, I mean, when did self-publishing really come on the, the scene? You know, when did everybody start buying Kindles? You know, 2007, 2008, is that when it really popped? I, yeah, 2011, I think, when it really popped, you know. Right. Mm. So, so this whole notion of managing, of self-published writers managing their rights after they die or in a will or trust document is so new that, that the support systems haven't developed yet for it. And so I think we're going to be seeing those support systems developing over time. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think it, this is a big missing thing because, of course, I mean, and I've known in the five years I've been doing this, several writers who've died early. Obviously, there's diseases and things happen mm -hmm. and people have died. And it's been like, well, what do you do? Because self-publishing has got so many like logons for a start. I mean, logons are just a crazy thing. But before we get into the detail, um, just on right. back on the age thing. So mm -hmm. when, you know, when should authors be thinking about this? Is it more a case of how many books you have or how much money you're making rather than age, for example? Um, well, I think that it's probably a good idea to have uh, some kind of will as early as possible. It doesn't need to be um, extraordinarily detailed at the beginning of your career and as your career develops and as you have uh, more books and you want to be thinking about maybe doing one thing with one set of books and one thing with another set of books. I mean you for example have two very uh, different writing personalities. You have your fiction and your nonfiction. Mm. And it may be that your fiction books lend themselves to a certain disposition and your nonfiction books lend themselves to a different uh, disposition. And even within your fiction books, you have um, a variety of series that you, know, you could do different things with. I think you should think about it earlier um, and then uh, as your work, body of work becomes uh, more developed, you can tweak it. You can start, you know, okay, I want to change this, I want to change that. But I think that it's something that you should think about early because as you just mentioned, um, you know, people drop, die prematurely. Mm -hmm. They could be involved in, you know, a car accident or they could get sick or whatever. And then all of a sudden, here they have a dozen works and they have, you know, multiple logons and they have 
all of these different pieces of their business that they've been managing themselves. And um, somebody has to swoop in, scoop it all up, and sort it all out. Mm. And that's what we, you want to avoid as a writer. You want to avoid that kind of chaos in mm. the event of your early demise. If you live a nice, long, healthy life, then you really get to plan it out and be very pristine and very, you know, clear about what you're going to do. And it's easier that way. Mm. But so many, you know, so many people don't necessarily know when they're going to die, obviously. I mean, I, I th I've been thinking a lot about this because a friend of mine did, did die earlier this year, you know, a young, young woman, and she was super organized. She knew she was dying. And in the last nine months of her cancer, you know, she documented everything. Like she was brilliant about it. And I'm sitting here thinking, I still haven't done that. I promised I would do it earlier this year and I still haven't done that. You know, so, so I guess what are some of the things that should be covered I mean, normally when you go to a lawyer, you wouldn't say, here are my logons and things like that. But, you know, what are the things that are covered by, say, a will versus things that authors need to do separately? Well, um, so record keeping. OK, good bookkeeping. Um, there should be an inventory of your creative portfolio. You should have that inventory. And when you first go to a lawyer to have a will drafted, you should have that inventory in your possession. Mm -hmm. You should be um, keeping uh, a list of all of your accounts and all of their passwords, all of your licenses, if you license your work, um, and all of the sources of your income streams, all of that should be nice and orderly and more printed out. My recommendation, and this is actually a good week to talk about this, is that you should update your list of accounts and passwords uh, when you change the clocks. Ah, good point. So it's mm -hmm. like, okay, we're, we're falling back an hour this week, so let's go through. I mean, I have a, a list of my accounts and my logons and my passwords, and I just, you know, I just cross it out and maintain um, the list, and I just did it this week to make sure that everything's current. Mm. Um, so you, you want to have that. You want to have your inventory, and then when you get your will created, you want to keep them all together in a place where, and you want to let your executor know that they are your executor and give them a copy of everything. Um, now, updating that list of passwords every six weeks, every six months is good for you. I don't think you need to send that to your executor every six months. That would be a great habit to get into. Um, but as long as they know where to find it, I think that's what's important. Mm. So the, what you do with the attorney or the lawyer would be, this is, this is the, the person or the organization that now owns the copyright, for example, but you would do a separate document that didn't go to the lawyer with all the logons and actual things that you would need practically. Right, okay, so the way it works is your copyrights become part of your estate. All right, and then um, when you go to see uh, an estate and trust lawyer to have your will drafted, you um, select a personal representative who will manage your estate. And that personal representative is in charge of gathering up all the assets and uh, reporting to the heirs uh, based on the instructions in the will and based on the rules and laws of the local jurisdiction. That's a standard um, operation. For, for self-published authors, what we're talking about is also designating a literary trustee, mm -hmm. someone who is responsible for the management of your um, creative portfolio, mm -hmm. not a personal representative who handles your estate. So the literary trustee's focus was, is simply on um, managing the revenue streams from your creative portfolio. Those revenue streams then would be parsed out to the heirs um, as indicated in the will. So that person works with the personal representative. Mm. So the question becomes, there are a lot of questions in choosing that person. 
Mm. Um, who is the best person for that job? Um, what are the qualities that you want to look for in a person to do that job? Um, first of all, you want somebody who's willing to do the job. Yeah. You want somebody who has some experience, um, if not expertise, in the self-publishing industry. Somebody who has good uh, business judgment, good sense, and knows how to negotiate a contract and a license. Um, given the nature of marketing of self-published books, you need somebody who has expertise or uh, experience in social media marketing and other types of marketing. And who knows where the marketing is going to go? I mean, is <laughs> You know, as we're sitting here today, it's Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn and your blog and YouTube and podcasts and these things. But who knows where that's going to go? Um, so you have to consider what your business looks like now and who is going to be a match for continuing that business model and who's going to be innovative enough to um, go with whatever the flow is in the next 10 years, 20 years, 70 years out. Mm. So you have to, so that's a very complicated set of uh, criteria or qualifications that you have to consider. And it, and it may not be your sister. <laughs> yeah, it probably won't be your sister. I <laughs> know. Uh, <laughs> that's exactly right. Um, but it might be your sister who benefits from the income that's produced. Let's, let's, we talked about what the qualifications were for choosing a literary yeah. executor. Yeah. So now let's talk a little bit about what their duties should be so we can mm -hmm. be a little more specific about what it is they're going to be doing as an executor of your creative portfolio. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you have to decide how much power they have over your work, okay? Whether they have absolute power and that they can make any decision that you could make with respect to your work. Can they issue new licenses? Can they terminate old licenses? Can they um, change license arrangements in terms of the fees, in terms of the cost of the license? Can they hire a lawyer? Can they redesign covers? Can they uh, uh, choose who's going to do an audio book? So what are the, um, the duties that you're going to give them? What about, for instance, if you have unfinished manuscripts? Oh, yeah. Do not okay. publish them. <laughs> do not publish them? OK. All right. <laughs> What about um, uh, your emails? Ooh. Okay. Do you want them all destroyed? Can they publish them? Can they do a biography of you? I mean, think about that. That's not what you're thinking about right now because that's not your um, creative undertaking at the moment. Mm. But if somebody becomes the literary trustee of your body of work, that's going to include your notes, that's going to include um, your emails, it's going to include your blog posts, your podcasts, it's going to include everything. Can they create a compendium? Can they uh, put together a collection? Can they submit part of your work to a collection with other writers? Mm. So, I mean, it gets, it gets, the, the questions get pretty big. Yeah. And I mean, even, it doesn't, you don't even have to be dead because like we look at Harper Lee, what's happened with oh, I know. Go Set a Watchmen. And I don't think that she would have wanted that out there. I really just can't see that she, she would want a first draft of a book that became a classic. And that's basically what it was, right? Yep. And, but she is mentally well, we don't know what she is, but she's still alive. So, I mean, that was just crazy. And I would hate that to happen. We suspect that she is not, doesn't have the mental competence to make the decision mm. to publish Go Set a Watchman. Okay. Mm. And somebody is definitely 
making those decisions or assisting strongly in making those decisions for her. Yeah, and I, okay, so then, then, let's put it to you this way, um, you put all your, your um, rules and all your wishes and desires about how your work's going to be handled in your will, and you have a group of heirs that are going to benefit from those rules being followed. And then if the literary trustee doesn't follow the rules, or if the heirs decide that you really didn't mean those rules that you put in there, can the heirs remove the literary trustee? Mm. So do you want to have that in, as a provision in your will? You want to think about whether that literary trustee is going to get along with your heirs. <laughs> you know, because there's going to be, there's quite possibly going to be some head knocking involved. Mm. I so, don't even get on with my heirs, my siblings. <laughs> I mean, this is the, the reality is, I mean, most people's heirs and successors are family, aren't they? And, yes. you know, uh, that's where, you know, as Shakespeare wrote, where most of the problems are. So that that is really, really interesting. Um, okay, is there anything else on that? Because I have another question. Okay, uh, let's see. Um, uh, nope, I think that covers what the duties are of a literary mm. exam. Fantastic. So my question is, um, many indies, of course, will self-publish just under their personal names and they won't have set up an LLC or in England a limited company or something like that. But I mm -hmm. have a limited company. Um, so the author re retains the copyright, but the com I publish everything under my company and, and a company can survive uh, longer than a copyright, correct? I mean, as long as the company continues to run, it, the me as an individual, I, I can be dead and the company can carry on. So how does having a, a publishing company and, a, a, you know, a, an LLC or a limited company relate to mm -hmm. this topic? And how should the rights be done in that way? Mm -hmm. uh, well, it really it depends upon what you intend. Um, and when you talk about having a, a, your own company, Who's the owner of that company? Is it you? Yeah, I'm the director, and there's me and my husband are both directors. Yeah. Um, so are you the? So you own it fifty-fifty yeah. with him? Fifty-fifty uh, shareholding. Yeah. Right. So that fifty percent is going to be in your will because that becomes an asset of your estate, mm -hmm. and so you can then decide what happens to that fifty percent. Mm -hmm. um, so, but for some self-published writers who own the uh, company in its entirety, that becomes an asset of the estate, just like the copyrights become an asset of the estate. So, the company can go on and on mm. beyond uh, your death um, without a limit, like a copyright does have that 70-year limit in the U.S. and the U.K. Um, so you can either transfer the copyrights into the company and you which would in the United States have to be a writing in a transfer in writing mm. um, or you can have the um, literary uh, trustee work with the director of the company jointly much like you're doing now only you happen to be one person, mm. a director and the owner of the copyright. Yeah. So, but somewhere in you, you're working together. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So I, um, I mean, my, I think ahead to when I have this massive empire um, and I would employ a, a CEO who, who could run the company, e even though, even if they weren't a shareholder. So the shareholdings would get divested or whatever the word is, um, so that my heirs get the money from that but the company could still be run by uh, what would be the equivalent of a literary uh, estate manager or something. So if you had a COO running your company and your company is predominantly earning its income based on your creative portfolio um, then it's unlikely that you would need a literary mm. trustee. I yeah. mean because you've got somebody running the company. You've mm. got somebody who's negotiating the contracts, negotiating the licenses, monitoring the income, doing the marketing. You've already set that up in mm. a company. You're not gonna need a literary trustee. What you're going to need is a written contract um, that exists past your death, allowing your company um, to use those copyrights. You need right. that license in writing 
Okay, so role for a literary trustee in managing that license, but that role is going to be a lot smaller if you have a fully operating company that is um, monetizing your creative portfolio. Hmm. So I see, you know, as as your empire grows <laughs> and you have dozens of employees, um, you know, the, the larger your company uh, becomes the less need you're going to have for a literary trustee. That, yeah. That's how I see that working that way. Yeah, no, me too. Um, and what would, it say, um, obviously most people are not, um, you know, have the global media empire mindset that I do. Um, some people will, but others will be like, well, I just have two books and I want, you know, my daughter or my son to benefit from that. What is a, an appropriate amount to be paying a literary trustee? So you would pay an agent 15%. Um, right. So is that what we're sort of talking about? Well, um, that would be perfectly acceptable if you could find somebody to do the work for fifteen <laughs> percent. And it, it, I mean, think about it. If you are an indie with just two books and you're making a living off of those two books, which is great, um, unlikely. <laughs> <laughs> It, it is unlikely. Um, so what are the chances you're going to find somebody to accept the job of doing everything you do except the creative part, mm -hmm. but all of the marketing, all of the management, all of the sales um, uh, for 15% mm -hmm. when you as the author are getting 100%. So. Right now, I don't know how many people are out there to accept that level of work for a 15% commission for an indie who only has two books, okay? Yeah. So, but if there's a series, if you have a series and it has proven um, royal uh, income generation, um, you're more likely to get somebody out there who is going to manage those rights and manage that portfolio for 15 percent um yeah so that's that's the you know the 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 mark would be 15 percent if you talk to lawyers they're going to want an hourly fee mm. which is on the other end of the spectrum it is not a good deal no. that's not a good deal so so that's why we have to have this this growth of this industry it really has to happen and then there's going to be a vetting of the self-published authors, the indie authors, uh, to determine whether their books are earning something that would justify the amount of work for a non-creator to put in it to um, continue that, mm -hmm. that piece of creative work. Yeah, no, I totally get you. And of course, I do 50-50 splits with co-authors, translators, you know, that type of thing. And, and that often, you know, that can feel unfair sometimes, depending on how much work each party does. And, and you know, the 50-50s are a good thing, but equally, they're, like you're saying, I mean, once the author is uh, dead, <laughs> let you know, we have to face it. The, the work is all being done by that um, that literary trustee. So, and and the um, it doesn't make sense for the heirs and success to make loads of money um, when they're doing nothing. So I totally get your point there. So, so you know, so the business model has to be developed. Yeah. It's, and at the beginning, it's going to have to be very flexible so that people will go into the business so that they mm. will start managing these rights. Mm. And then they're going to have to learn what they can earn and what is fair in exchange for the amount of labor that they're putting in through this as people start going into that into that business mm. otherwise they're just not you're not going to get anybody to help you out no and I like your idea when you said up front about the um, you know my two different things I mean it would make sense for my thrillers to go to a thriller literary trustee and my oh, yeah. non-fiction to go into some writing you know stuff for writers type of area although I think that often non-fiction ages you know fast and non and fiction doesn't age you know stories That's Go That's on. exactly right. That's exactly right. Because, you know, your nonfiction books have a shelf life mm. based on the technology that you're writing about today, mm. if, if you think about that in that sense, you mm. know. 
So, and your, and your fiction doesn't. Yeah. Because a good mystery, uh, you know, a good thriller, it, people go back to them all the time. I go back and read from the 30s and 40s all the time. Good, good plot is good plot. It lasts, you know. Mm. And it's quite, it's actually funny you say that because I actually like print, I like keeping the print copies of my nonfiction almost so I can remember what it was like, you know, a couple of years ago. So, and I can, I'm like, oh, I wrote that? How did I write that? That's so not true now. <laughs> right. It, that's right. But what it does is it shows that you have the background and have been following the industry mm. since, you that know, time. It, mm. since it was taking those little baby steps. Mm, which is fascinating. And, and what's also interesting, looking at the big literary agencies, most of them are built on the back of, of uh, dead authors, right? I mean, yes. they're built on money that's made from authors like Ian Fleming's estate, for example, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. Tolkien's estate. And I, I guess maybe we just don't feel like we'll ever be like that. Um, but how will we know, I guess? Well, you won't. You'll be dead. Yeah. <laughs> Let's inject some humor into the dead conversation. <laughs> but no, but, I, I think this is brilliant. I really do. But the, um, the, the writers that come after you are going to watch this and benefit from this. And, it, they, you know, it will get better over time and it will get more polished. I think that in these early Wild Wild West days, you know, you have to be careful because... Um, people who would be less than honest might jump up and try and take advantage of um, indie published authors. So I think you have to be careful and I think you have to do your homework until it all kinds of, it, it shakes out and you see what's gone on before. Now one idea, and I haven't thought this through completely, but one idea is, is the indie co-op. Right. And um, to get indie, right, you say you you um, agreed to be a trustee, a literary trustee for some of your friends who are writers. Mm. OK, so but that's still you out there on your own. But what about an indie co-op that really manages these rights and that there's some kind of um, coalition or group of indies that are answering this question and really brainstorming this question and mm. setting up a structure? to um, address it, it's contrary to how most of you guys work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it would be like herding cats, it really would. <laughs> uh, I know. I know. Everyone's so opinionated. <laughs> um, let me just, while I think of it, let me just throw in this one little item that um, uh, I want everybody to be aware of when they choose a literary trustee. If they choose um, a company, if these companies do you know, come into existence. Make sure that there's a provision in there that says if the company goes bankrupt, that, mm. the, that the contract is terminated and that those rights revert back to the estate to be redistributed to some other viable literary trustee. Because, and on this carries over into traditional publishing where publishing houses have gone bankrupt and the copyrights are in the estate of the publishing house and they don't go back to the author to be lost forever. So mm. I just want to throw that out there because that applies equally with this, you know, new frontier that we're facing. Yeah, so so then obviously you're you're in the uh, the US. Uh, will these things be different by country? I mean, they sound pretty similar to the UK, to be fair. Um, you know, what are, are there any country specific things people should watch out for? Um, so, okay, so copyright law is one of the most international laws that is out there right now because of the Berne Convention. Um, so the fact that um, your copyrights uh, live longer than you do, that's a pretty international concept. Now, how much longer they live um, differs by country. And um, it ranges from life plus 25 years to right now in Mexico, it's life plus 100 years. I understand, rumor has it that's changing shortly. But so um, the length of the term might be different by country, but the fact that it 
the rights survive um, the life of the author um, is the same internationally. Mm. So the considerations that indie authors have are going to apply internationally. You've got to think about what happens to your rights um, after you die in just about every country in the world, except, you know, there are some countries that um, I, I'm not clear on copyright existing beyond the life of the author in some African countries right now. Um, so that's going to be international in flavor. What's really local in flavor is the um, estates and trusts piece of it. Mm. So in the United States, we have 50 states and a bunch of territories, and the um, estates and trust law is different in every single state. And not only that, but the procedures are different in every single county in every single state. So to put the pieces together, you need a local lawyer. You can't avoid that. The concept is international in flavor. Um, the things that we've been talking about in terms of the business, that's going to be international in flavor. Mm -hmm. But making it, um, the mechanics of it are going to be very local. Mm. Yeah, which is pretty hardcore. So just as a really basic thing, if, if listeners want to go into a local uh, attorney's office and get uh, this sorted out, what, mm -hmm. do they, what do they go in and ask for? Um, well, I think you want an estates and trusts attorney who has some familiarity with inter intellectual property rights, okay? Um, so you want to know that they have some experience with other creative professionals and have handled the wills or trusts of other creative professionals so that they know how it works, that they know how the mechanisms are developing. Um, and that would be the preliminary question and, you know, get some examples of people that they've represented and then go in with your list of copyrights. These are, this is my creative portfolio. Um, and then with an idea of what kind of income you're making from it mm -hmm. so that you can have a meaningful conversation about who to choose as a trustee, who to choose as a personal representative, and making decisions about your heirs and how you're going to divide it up or whether you're going to choose to give it to charity, those kinds of things. Mm. Yeah, and just on that, I wanted to tell everyone, you know, Beatrix Potter, who's one of, you know, my hero heroines, um, it w it was child free as I am and left her estate to the National Trust and basically bought the Lake District in Britain with the proceeds of her books. And, you know, I just think there's amazing things that can be done with estates, right? It's, it's a, it is a very exciting uh, when you think about it. So you also have this great rip off protection guide for creatives. So just yeah. tell us a bit about that and where to find that so people can uh, find a bit more about you as well. Well, you can find out about me at my website, which is www.charmcitylegal.com. Um, the ripoff protection report for creative professionals is something that I developed to give some very basic um, pointers to creative professionals on how to protect their work online and offline, it the notion of estate planning, talks about good uh, bookkeeping, record keeping, talks about um, what goes into a fair agent's agreement if you choose to do that, and it gives you some basic pointers on um, copyright law and how to protect um, your work. And then um, that, of course, puts you on my mailing list, and I try to um, email uh, podcasts such as this one, um, and uh, blog posts, and various things on uh, topics to educate creatives on um, how to continue to protect their work. Um, I just finished uh, an online course for creative professionals. Um, it was a live course, and I called it Content Protection for Creative Professionals. Lasted for four weeks, and we met weekly and talked about their portfolios and how to protect them. Um, and then I gave them some real good action steps so that they can go off and put it into their workflow. Mm. 
the, my goal is to try to um, educate artists and writers so that they really don't need to call me unless they're really stuck. <laughs> and, and people can get the ripoff protection guide at your, at your website? Right on my website, on the home page, or on my profile page, or you know, any of the blog posts, there, there's a link there. So I, yeah. Thank you so much for your time, Catherine. That was amazing. Oh, thank you for inviting me, Joanna. I really appreciate it.